Welcome to the Fuel Paul Show podcast. My name is Eric Bjornstad and I am your host and your guide through the ever-changing world of fuel. The Fuel Pulse Show podcast, if you've never joined us before, it is for anyone who uses fuel or has things that use fuel, whether that's at work or at home, which means it is pretty much for anyone, especially anyone whose job requires them to take care of fuel uh, because they need it to work to get the job done, whatever that job may be. So if you think that any of that sounds a l- at least a little bit like you, then the Fuel Pulse Show podcast is going to be for you. So at this point, we always ask the question in each episode, what are we going to talk about today? Today's podcast is going to be a little bit more of a stored fuel-centric topic. More specifically, we want to talk about a topic that is top of mind for those professionals who have to deal with and manage stored fuel. There is an awful lot of stored fuel across the country. Think about all the places um, and all the kinds of places, all the kinds of businesses and entities that have to store fuel for later use of some kind. Some of those kinds of places are easy to think of. Uh, Gas stations are obvious. Gas stations have multiple large underground fuel storage tanks. Uh, They have to have those because they sell fuel. They sell gas. They sell diesel. Um, Utilities, uh, public infrastructure facilities, fire stations, uh, police stations, um, those kind of places, they all have fuel storage tanks. Uh, with fuel for backup storage or uh, for for backup like emergency use. Now, speaking of backup use, hospitals and healthcare facilities like, say, nursing homes, they are a really big part of this market, Um, at least in the state of Florida. uh, But uh, I would imagine in many other places across the country, Hospitals and healthcare facilities are required by law to have a certain amount of stored backup fuel ready and viable for emergency use. Now, in Florida, there was a a huge tragedy a few years ago when a hurricane came through and a nursing home lost power and were not able to run their air conditioning. And a number, unfortunately, a number of the elderly residents ended up passing away from from overheating. And shortly after that, the state of Florida changed the law uh, to try and head off future problem situations. So now, facilities in the state of Florida, like nursing homes, they have to keep a certain amount of stored backup fuel uh, ready so that they can run their 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 vital systems like their air conditioning for uh, between 48 and 72 hours. They have to do this in order to stay in compliance with the regulations. So there's lots of stored fuel in different places. But there's lots of fuel storage tanks. And all of that stored fuel has to be taken care of. And so we're going to talk about a specific aspect of taking care of that fuel. And that is what you have to add to the fuel to solve microbial problems. And what, we, as we will find out later, the answer to that is you have to use what's called a biocide. But we do not just want to talk about biocides because if we're honest, that can get into being a little bit of a niche discussion. Uh, there's plenty of technical dirt to dive into if you're going to have that kind of discussion. And honestly, that's not going to be as overtly interesting to enough people for us to spend the whole episode talking just about that. So we, we don't really want to get tied up uh, in those weeds, so to speak. So in today's episode, we want to aim the conversation more at the people out there who have that responsibility for keeping the fuel ready for use. Now, if you're one of those people, then chances are you probably already know that microbial problems exist. You may even know that the way that you solve those is to use a biocide. But this is where it starts to get tricky because there's a lot of noise out there in the marketplace when you start looking at what your options are uh, to, to find one of those things. And as you start to search for what you hope, 
is the best solution for your problem, it can really start to get confusing. And you can get into a situation where it's easy to get fooled into investing in something that isn't actually going to do the job that you need it to do. So that is what we want to talk about today. This whole area of thought of what you should use to solve microbial problems if you take care of stored fuel. You can't use just any old thing. Biocides are specific uh, chemistries, uh, specific, specific chemical chemistries that are made to do the specific job of killing microbes uh, and that's the job that you need them to do. But you want to make sure, if you're choosing a biocide, you want to make sure that you're using the right biocide, the right one. And there, it is easy to get confused. So we're going to aim to give you the tools to cut through that confusion. We're even going to talk about how you can tell if something is actually a biocide versus something that tries to fool you into thinking that it is, but it's really not, and it's really not going to do what you need to do. And I mean, seriously, that happens a lot more often than you might think, because there are lots of things out there that want you to think that they do the important stuff like killing microbes, but in the end, they really don't do that. And by the time you're able to figure out that they're not going to do that and that they're not what you really needed in the first place, you've already spent the money. The problem has probably gotten worse because time, more time has elapsed. And the only thing that you can really do about it is go back to the drawing board and go back searching again for the right solution. So in today's episode, uh, we're going to try and help you not make that mistake. So in this episode of the Fuel Pulse Show podcast, let's dive into the uber exciting yet really important topic of biocides for stored fuel. So, to frame this discussion and give it some meaningful context, it's uh, really necessary for us to talk about all that fuel that's being stored. All that fuel is what's called ultra-low sulfur diesel, or ULSD. It ha it's, it's designated as ultra-low sulfur because, uh, by law, it ha has a maximum sulfur content of 15 parts per million which is not very much. Um, and that it's a big difference uh, from the low sulfur and the high sulfur diesel fuels that used to be the norm you know, years ago. Now, we won't go into the nuances of why they made the change of lowering the sulfur level so much. We just need to keep in mind that taking the sulfur out of the diesel fuel changed it in fundamental ways, ways that make today's fuel, today's diesel fuel, a far more hospitable home for microbial growth. Um, they used to think, or they used to blame it on the fact that they would say, well, they took the sulfur out and they would say, well, sulfur inhibited microbial growth. They might even use a catchy line like, uh, sulfur is a natural biocide, but that's not really true. And describing it like that can be, I don't know, a little misleading and not really accurate um, because there's, there's, there are plenty of things that are high in sulfur that microbes will grow in. So that kind of belies that logic. Um, but one of the things that happened when they took all that sulfur out was they, they had another regulation that came up a, alongside of it. And that was that they, they not only capped or lowered the cap on sulfur content, but they also changed the ratio of uh, what they call aromatic molecules in the diesel fuel. Aromatic molecules, if you've ever taken a chemistry class, they're designated by those kind of circular, uh, those carbon rings, and they have a little circle in them. Uh, benzene, if you've ever seen the chemical symbol for benzene, that is probably the simplest uh, aromatic molecule. Um, and uh, one of the things that they know is that if you lower aromatic content of fuel that's being burned, the emissions are better for the environment. And so what they did 
uh, while also while while mandating that they take the sulfur out, is they also lowered the maximum amount of aromatic content that you could have in diesel fuel. Now that uh, changed the fuel fundamentally because. Um, if you don't have aromatic molecules in there, you have a different kind of molecule in there, what they call aliphatic molecules. Aliphatic molecules, uh, again, if you go back to a chemistry class, they're, they are all those kind of straight line uh, chains of carbons. Uh, the stuff like, you know, ethanol, uh, prop uh, uh, propane, um, uh, heptane, hexane, octane, and all those kind of ones that are just set uh, 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 based around long chain, straight chain carbon molecules, and they don't have all those rings with the little circles in them. Those are all aliphatics. And so you have fewer aromatics in the diesel fuel, you have more aliphatics. And the reason that matters is because microbes don't really like to consume aromatic carbon molecules for food, if you will. But they do like to consume and they do like to grow around aliphatics and so when they were taking the carb the the sulfur out of the fuel they were also in order to make it better for the environment um, taking away some of the things that microbes don't like and adding in more of the things that microbes do like and so what you end up with is you end up with fuel that is a much more hospitable home for microbial growth and that is what we had today. We have a fuel landscape where the diesel fuel that's being used, and the diesel fuel that's being stored, is a lot more likely to develop microbial problems than the diesel fuels from uh, 20 or 30 or 40 years ago. Now, one thing to think about is uh, the timeline uh, governing how all of these changes happened. The final drop to 15 parts per million sulfur uh, was supposed, according to the regulations, was supposed to happen around 2007. The initial drop happened around 1992. And then 19, uh, around 2007, they dropped it again. Um, so 2007, they say, okay, all the new on-road diesel fuel it has to be ultra-low sulfur diesel. All the diesel fuel that you buy at the gas station, it has to be uh, ultra-low sulfur diesel fuel. But they made an exception for the off, what's called the off-road diesel fuel. That any diesel fuel that's not used in an on-road vehicle. Uh, and so that means diesel fuel being used in say backup generator systems um, diesel fuel that's being used in the marine market diesel fuel that's being used uh, uh, for any kind of what they call off-road basically any kind of non-on-road uh, uh, use they made an exception for that and they basically uh, allowed that to still be low sulfur diesel now, the intention was always going to be that eventually all of the fuel, both off-road and on-road, was going to be ultra-low sulfur diesel. That was the expectation. But what we, have to re what we have to remember, if you will, is that the EPA were realists. They, they're not just bureaucrats who have no idea what's going, out there, going on out there in the real world. They, they do know what's going on. They, they do live in the real world, if, if you want to put it that way. Um, and they knew that you couldn't just say in 2007, you couldn't just wave a wand at one time and replace all of the nation's uh, fuel all across the fruited plain. Uh, make, snap your fingers and make it magically change from low sulfur to ultra low sulfur diesel. Doesn't work that way, obviously. You have to give it time for to essentially to work that fuel out of the nation's fuel storage system. And so um, they gave it a lot of time. They gave it a number of years. Um, and then eventually, we'll say a few years later, eventually they said, okay, enough time has passed. They, they said that any new fuel being added to these off-road storage tanks, being added to these hospital storage tanks or these police station storage or these marine storage tanks, they said any new fuel has to be ultra-low sulfur diesel. 
Uh, so you have a little more being phased in. Um, and, but what you would end up happening is you'd have lots of situations across the country where you'd have a storage tank that's always had uh, high sulfur and then low sulfur diesel. That's just the, the fuel that was available. So it's always had that. And they let's say they've been using it and uh, you never let one of those tanks get completely you know, dry, if you will, you use up all the fuel in there. So there's a little bit of that fuel in there. Um, which is low sulfur, but when we say low sulfur, we're really talking like 500 parts per million. Um, so now they have to add ultra low sulfur on top of that. So they add, you know, let, let's say it's five, the tank is down to 5% capacity. So that's 5% low sulfur diesel. You had 95, you fill it back up, 95% of it is now ultra low sulfur diesel. What's going to be the sulfur content of that mix? Well, it's still going to be out of compliance. Um, let's say you're you're going to end up with fuel that's 35 parts per million, and that technically is out of compliance. But then you draw that down, you use that, and you use that, and you add more ultra low sulfur diesel, and eventually you're able to work all that low sulfur fuel out of the system, and all of the fuel that's left is ultra low sulfur diesel that's below 15 parts per million. But it takes time for that to happen. And it was no secret. Everybody knew that it was going to take a number of years to work all of that out of the system. But fast forward to you know, 2022, the phase-in period has been over for a little while now. And so all of the stored fuel that you're going to find out there is supposed to be ultra low sulfur diesel. So why are we talking about this? Well, what we have to consider, um, we have to consider that um, how, how the, the timing of that uh, intersects with when those storage tanks and how often those storage tanks are being checked. Now, let me explain what I mean. So stored fuel, if you think about it, and those of you out there who have ever been in a situation where you have to manage stored fuel, you know that human nature dictates that something like fuel in a storage tank, it can tend to be a little bit out of sight, out of mind, unless you happen to be in a place like, let's say, a hospital, where you know that you're going to have regular inspections that are essentially going to force you to check on these things regularly. For the people who aren't in those situations, they have fuel in that tank, but that's not what they're thinking about. They're thinking of all the other stuff that they have to do. And so that fuel just kind of sits there and they're not worrying about it. And that happened in a lot of places across the country, there ended up being a lot of storage, thousands upon thousands of diesel storage tanks across the country that had ultra low sulfur diesel in it that was not being checked regularly. And what happens when you don't check the fuel regularly? Well, you can probably guess that where we're going with this is that if you don't check the fuel regularly, microbial problems can tend to bloom and development if you're not watching things. Now, take that fact and now consider the fact of, at least for those of us in the Southeast, you know, I'm in Florida, but you've got the whole Gulf Coast region and you've got Louisiana and Texas and all those, those states and all those states in the Southeast, the ones that have to worry about hurricanes. Consider the fact that in 2004 and 2005, we had all those hurricanes, just one hurricane after another for like two straight years. And a hurricane is an event that will force fuel management professionals to scramble and check their fuel because they need to make sure that those emergency systems are going to work when they see this hurricane developing and when it starts to look like it's going to hit them, they have to, they check their fuel. They make sure that everything's running properly. But when you go for a long time without having a hurricane, which is exactly what happened from the mid 2000s till the mid 2010s, let's say, that's exactly what happened. There was a, a significant period when you 
didn't really have any number of hurricanes of any substantial amount, if you will. And so what happened is all those people who, after the storms of 2004, 2005, 2006, they put ultra-low sulfur diesel in those storage tanks. And then no hurricanes for a while. And so what happened? What do we think happened? Well, all that ultra-low sulfur diesel, if it wasn't being used up in other applications, it kind of got forgotten about. Remember, out of sight, out of mind. Now, fast forward to the last, let's say, five years, suddenly we're getting storms again. And when the most recent storms came through, there were an awful lot of generators, an awful lot of really important backup systems, systems that use the backup fuel that we've been talking about. A lot of those places did not function properly when they were really needed to because the ultra-low sulfur diesel fuel in them was forgotten about and microbial problems had been allowed to sneak in, if you will. So, we have established or introduced the idea that ultra-low sulfur diesel fuel makes it easy for microbes to grow. It has a lot, of, it has a lot less resistance to microbial growth than the diesel fuels of the past. We further established that there's an awful lot of ultra-low sulfur diesel out there that's waiting for microbes and microbial problems to manifest in their tanks. So the question now is, how do you solve a microbial problem? And this is where people can start getting tripped up because the way of handling these things that they were so sure of in the past does not work well enough anymore. See, back in the old days, the common theory for fuel management, some of you who have been in the business for longer than others will remember this. The common uh, theory, common, shall we say, train, train of thought, I guess, maybe uh, the best way to put it. The common theory for fuel management was that in order to prevent microbial problems, well, all you had to do was control water. You know, check the water. If you see any, get rid of it. That's all you need to do. If you do that, you're, you, you're not really going to expect to have microbial problems. But because of the way the fuel has changed, the ways we were talking about earlier, that's no longer the case. And it's for a, a couple of reasons. I mean, the way that the fuel has changed in terms of its composition, we've already established that that contributes to it. Uh, another reason is because it's just about impossible to keep all the water from getting in there. Um, and there are tanks uh, out there that, let's say they're uneven, so you check the tanks, maybe you check the high end and you don't realize that it's kind of slanted a little bit and all that water is actually collected down here, whereas you're checking it up here. You never know. There's a lot of storage tanks out there with baffles that have pockets of water, and it does not take very much water for a microbial problem to grow and get established. And so this idea that, well, all you have to do is keep water out of the tank, well, it's impossible to keep water out of that tank. And therefore, that way of handling or preventing microbial problems is no longer good enough. If you have stored fuel today, you are just about guaranteed that at some point you will develop microbial problems, microbial growth, microbial contamination, however you want to put it. It's only a matter of time that that is going to establish itself in the fuel storage system that you manage. And so if you accept that as a realistic fact of life, you have to be prepared to answer the question, what am I going to do to get rid of the problem when it appears? So let's talk a little bit about that. So the bottom line answer to that question is the only thing that stops a microbial contamination situation is application of a biocide. That is the bottom line. That's the first bottom line baseline answer that we're going to build upon is you have to start with that. Now, a biocide, some, most people call them biocides. Some people call them microbiocides. Um, they're chemical treatments uh, that are used in fuel, but they can be used in other liquids as well. 
and they kill microbes. All different kinds of microbes. They kill bacteria, they kill molds, they kill fungus, they kill yeast. They kill all of those kinds of things. And biocides, in terms of uh, 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 the chemical market for them, biocides are a multi-billion dollar market slice that are widely used in a number of different industries that have to battle microbial problems. Um, you know, we tend to look at things from kind of a stored fuel centric uh, viewpoint, but biocides for stored fuel, it's probably less than 10% of the, the, the overall pie uh, in terms of biocide usage. Uh, the oil and the, uh, what they call the upstream oil and gas industry. So you're talking about the refineries, you're talking about the drilling rigs, the fracking, the people who are extracting it out of the ground. Uh, the the upstream segments of the oil and gas industry use millions, hundreds of millions of dollars worth of biocides because they have really expensive equipment that develops microbial growth on it, and they have drilling fluids. The and and if they do not use biocides religiously and rigorously. They will develop corrosion problems. They're gonna their drilling equipment's gonna get damaged, and they're gonna face real, uh, really substantial financial consequences. Um, they know that if they don't use biocides, they're gonna incur millions of dollars in damage from microbial growth and contamination. So, from their standpoint, they don't have any choice. It's an essential business decision for the oil and gas industry. Biocides are also used in a lot of coatings. They're used in places like, uh, you know, water cooling towers and wood surfaces in, in, the, in, in water cooling towers are places they get treated with biocides because those are excellent places for microbes to establish and grow. And so they use biocides in, in, in those environments to control that growth. Um, even, uh, you know, as an aside, even in consumer products, um, I mean, the next time you're in the shower, look on the back of your shampoo bottle. Or if you're in the kitchen and you use some of that, you know, that pump liquid soap, look on the package and see if you see something with a really weird long name like uh, methyl isothiazolinone. Um, that is a biocide. They have to put biocides in consumer products like shampoos and liquid soaps because believe it or not, uh, a bottle of shampoo, if you just leave it there on the shelf, it will develop a microbial problem. Microbes will grow in it um, uh, uh, if, if it's left long enough. So they have to add, and, you know, it's not very much, but they have to use biocides in shampoo and liquid soaps to extend their usable shelf life. So as a fuel management person, once you're sure that you have a microbial problem, and how you can be sure about that is where things like microbial testing come, come in, which is something we'll talk about on a later episode. Um, so once you're sure that you have a microbial problem, and you may happen to know that in order to get rid of it, you need to find a bi good biocide to use. Now you have the important task of finding what you know that you need. And that can be kind of tricky because there are plenty of things out there that, well, I mean, when it comes down to it, they want you to buy them. And how are they going to do that? Well, they're going to do that by implying that either that they are a buyer side, that they're what you're, you're looking for. Maybe they imply that. Or maybe they imply that they work the same as a buyer side, even if they don't. And if you don't know any better you see what they're claiming or you look at this thing and you don't have any reason to disbelieve what they're saying. So you could be fooled by them. And that would be a problem because like we mentioned earlier, those things probably aren't by our sides. They're not going to do what you need them to do. And you're, you're not going to solve your problem. All the only thing you're going to lose, the only thing that's going to happen is you're going to lose the money that you spent and the time while that problem, instead of getting solved, just kept developing and developing. So there are lots of things out there that are trying to get people to buy them by making claims that fool people into thinking that they are biocides when they are not. 
So there are fuel treatments out there. For example, you may have seen something like this. Um, there are fuel treatments out there that talk about how they control water to prevent or control microbial growth. Lots of fuel ads out there that talk about doing that. Now, um, that idea, control water to prevent microbial growth, that should sound familiar because not just, you know, only a few minutes ago, we were talking about how the conventional wisdom back before ultra low sulfur diesel was that the only thing you needed to do to control microbes was get rid of the water or control the buildup of water. So there's lots of chemicals out there in the marketplace who are, are trying to, uh, you know, continue, keep that outdated advice alive, if you will. And so they imply that they control microbes by controlling water. Now, if you take that statement, you take that claim, there's a couple of problems with making that claim, a couple of problems with them making those kind of statements. So the first problem is, as we just said, that logic's no longer workable for ULSD. Something that controls water isn't going to control microbes anymore, if it ever did in the first place. So that's the first problem. But the broader problem, the bigger problem, is that those products, when they're, t when they're making their product claims, the claims that they're making are being worded specifically to make them sound like they're a buyer side. And you as the potential customer, you know, you went looking for something to solve a microbial problem in your system. And so you have something before you that is telling you that it does exactly what you're looking for, but it doesn't. It doesn't do what you're looking for. And so, you know, how do you avoid getting in that trap? Well, let's take a stab at talking about how to equip you to avoid that problem. Okay, so the question is, how do you know what's, what is actually a biocide and what is a good biocide versus something that is may not even be a biocide at all? Now, because of the nature of what biocides are, there are certain rules that uh, govern them. There are certain rules, certain regulatory hurdles that they are subject to, that they have to cross and get over, that all those pretender treatments, if you want to call them that, all those pretender water control treatments, they haven't gotten over those hurdles. Um, so what do we mean by that? Well, a buyer side, uh, because of the nature of what it is, because a buyer side is a chemical that kills living things, they are highly regulated. And they have a number of regulatory requirements that they have to pass in order to um, be able to be legally sold out there in the marketplace. So the first thing is they have to be registered with the EPA's Office of Pesticides. Um, and in order to do that, when they, uh, you know, when they fill out their application for uh, registration, uh, they have, they're required to supply a wealth of testing data and safety data that aims to prove its effectiveness at killing microbes and aims to establish under what conditions it can be used safely and also establish how it affects the environment. Uh, all three of those are important things. You know, it, all, all of this stands to reason. Since their purpose as a biocide is to kill and get rid of microbiological contamination, first thing is they want to make sure they want they have to prove that the chemical actually kills things. It actually kills the microbes. And then the other two things, remember, establishing under what conditions it can be used safely and establish how it affects the environment, those are in there so that they can also establish how and where it can be used so that it doesn't kill the person who's uh, using it and doesn't destroy the environment if it gets out in there. And those are all admirable goals, to be sure. So given those regulatory requirements, and this is where we start, we get into a practical thing. When you're talking about how do you know um, whether something is actually a, a real buyer side, you know, you know, how do you know Pinocchio is a real boy, right? Um, this is probably the first 
important takeaway here that you'll want to remember when you when it comes to making a decision, um, if you ever have to come to that point. Um, there's an easy way that you can tell, an easy test you can use that will definitively tell you if the thing that you're considering before you is a legally approved biocide. Um, and this is true no matter what claims of effectiveness it's making. If it doesn't pass this test, it's not what you need. So if a biocide, something that is actually a legit biocide, when it's properly registered, when it is given approval by the EPA's Office of Pesticides to be sold as a biocide, what it's going to do is there are going to be a couple of registration numbers that are displayed on its label. Now, uh, when we say there are going to be a couple of registration numbers, maybe we should reword that. There, when it's sold out in the marketplace as a buyer side, it is required to list two registration numbers on its uh, label. And so, an easy way to tell, an easy litmus test for if this bottle of whatever fuel additive is actually a buyer side, no matter what it's selling you. The easy way to know for sure if it is, is if you can look on the labels and you can find those two registration numbers. Now, what are the registration numbers? Well, the first one will be called, funny enough, the EPA registration number. That's number one. The second one will be called the EPA establishment number. Okay, the registration number, what do these mean? The EPA registration number pertains to the registration of the chemical formula, the stuff, uh, the stuff that's doing the killing, if you will, the biocidal chemistry that's going to be killing the microbes. Now, the reason they're required to have that, the reason why it's important to have that on the label is because if there's a problem, then there needs to be some kind of official reference that on that bottle that definitively says this is the biocidal chemistry that this stuff is. Okay, it's, it's important to have uh, something that tells you for sure uh, that that's what it is. So that's number one, EPA registration number. The establishment number is interesting because the establishment number actually pertains to who uh, uh, is actually packaging the uh, or bottling the biocide. Um, and if you think about it, that, that is actually important. It really does matter because you can't have just anyone out there bottling stuff that kills things, right? Uh, you know, stuff that's hazardous. Um, a play, so any place that wants to bottle biocides has to have all of the relevant safety protocols in place, the relevant systems in place so that, you know, if there's a spill, it doesn't unduly impact the environment, the proper training to be able to do all this properly because biocides uh, can be tricky to handle because, again, they kill things. So you need to make sure that any facility that's going to be bottling it, um, you know, has its stuff together, so to speak. And so they will have a, an establishment number that identifies them. And so when they bottle it, you have to put their establishment number on the product label. So if something, if a product is making biocidal claims, which are any claims that imply that it kills microbes, if it's making those claims, but you look on the front label, you look on the back label, and you can't find those registration numbers, then that means, first of all, they're in violation of the law. Because if they are a buyer side, they're required to have them uh, be on there. And then second, they're in violation of the law. Because if they're not actually a buyer side, <clears throat> um, then it's illegal to try and pass yourself off as something that you're not. Now, one final thing to remember about the registration number requirement. I've said, you know, you're going to look on the front label, you're going to look on the back label, and maybe you're looking, you can't find it. And maybe you're trying to convince yourself that it actually is. So you say, well, it's, it's on there. I just didn't see it. Well, the problem is that the, the registration number requirement really belies that fact because the registration, or excuse me, the regulation dictate 
that the numbers have to be prominently displayed. That doesn't mean they have to be, you know, 80 point font plastered all over the front and back of the bottle. But they can't be, you know, tiny little two point font tucked away in a far corner. You have to be able to find them if you're looking for them. So that means if you are actually looking for them and you can't find them, then <clears throat> the, the, the chances are it wasn't your mistake. Chances are that they're not actually on there. And if you can't find them, if they're not on the label, they are not a buyer side. And if they're making buyer side or claims, they are in violation of the law. And you want to stay away from them, of course. Because, you know, as we said, because of the nature of what buyer sides are, they are subject to a lot of rules that other types of fuel additives are not subject to. They are unique in that respect. Um, so when we talk about biocidal claims, one big set of rules is, uh, uh, that biocide or biocidal products have to stay in line with involves the kinds of claims that they can make and the fact that those claims always have to square with the data that their registration has provided as evidence of being true. So, uh, what do we mean by that? Okay, um, you have seen a lot of uh, products out there, fuel additive products out there, not necessarily buyer side, but there's a lot of fuel additive products out there. Like, let's take gas, the typical gas additives that you find on the shelf at Walmart. We consider those to be consumer uh, market products, consumer aftermarket products. What's what's one of the commonalities between those? Well, generally speaking, the commonality is they all say they do the same thing, and they all say they're the best. And they may say it in a number of different ways. Ours is the best. We're better than everyone else. We're the market leader, you know, whatever. They all make these claims because they're trying to differentiate themselves from their competition. So they make all these claims. Um, but when it comes to buyer sides, Buyer sides can't make those kind of claims because any claim that's on the, the, the label or in the marketing literature has to be approved by the Office of Pesticides who are looking to make sure that what's being claimed about that buyer side is actually provable and so has a good chance of actually being true. So in from, from a practical standpoint, what that means is... You could have two biocides that are the exact same chemistry. Um, they're essentially the exact same thing. They are just white labels of the same chemistry. And so they, you know, they have different product names, but they're essentially the same. And one of them puts on its label, uh, this biocide is better than anything else on the marketplace. Well, they can't say that because... They're exactly the same as the other one. And the registration uh, uh, information, the test data that both of those submitted is probably going to be the same. Because again, remember, they're the same formula. So there's practically, there is no actual difference in performance between the two. And so the rules dictate that you can't, you can't, you, there's severe limitations on the kinds of claims that one of those buyer sides can make to try and set itself apart. Now, we happen to think that that's good for the marketplace because it means that if the buyer side is saying something, then you as the consumer or you as the customer um, have a lot less to worry about as far as, should I believe that claim? What about this other claim from this product over here? Which one is true? It's really... A, a, a regulatory requirement to help the consumer. Um, now, I mentioned something uh, just a moment ago, which is something else that's really unique to biocidal additives. Most people don't know that many of the biocide trade names out there are the same chemistries with just different names. They are what we call white labels. They're white labels or private labels of the same chemistries. Now, we'll talk a little bit about more of what those specifics imply for us a little bit later. But 
What happens when they're trying to bring it to market is they submit an application, a registration application with the EPA's Office of Pesticides. And they say, we're going to use this chemistry. And here's all the information, the, all the test data uh, showing that this chemistry works, that it works, you know, that it's safe to use in these different uh, situations, so on and so forth. They submit all that. So they've submitted information on how it works, um, how it kills microbes, and then also, importantly, what applications it can be used in. And the EPA will look all that over, and then they'll approve the biocide for use. But the approval is always contextual uh, because it's going to depend on, the approval is going to depend on what the evidence indicates um, of, of regarding where the, the chemistry is safe and effective to be used in. Um, so a couple of examples. Let, let's, let's kind of wrap up this, this first part one here by giving a couple of examples. So what we're establishing here is that um, a, when, some, when someone says that a biocide is approved for use, that never means that it is approved for use in any situation imaginable and in any kind of uh, use imaginable. Biocidal approvals are limited to what the evidence shows that they are effective in and safe to be used in. So a couple of examples to kind of wrap that up. Um, uh, you know, remember when we talked about what kinds of situations biocides are are used in? Um, you know, we said biocides are used in stored fuel. Biocides are used in drilling fluids. Biocides are used in water cooling towers. Um, one place that biocides don't tend to get approved in are in situations where they're going to come in contact with the potable water supply. Um, and the reason is because you don't want a poison getting into the water supply where people are going to drink. And so uh, it would be very, very rare to find, well, actually I'll backtrack. All of the biocides that you're likely to consider using in stored fuel, none of those will be approved to be used in potable water situations because they're not safe to be used in those situations. Um, Another example, which uh, is a little bit more specific, is the aviation industry. Now, it's, the aviation industry used to think <clears throat> that they didn't have microbial problems, but they are finding in recent times that they're getting a lot of microbial issues in jet fuel and in jet fuel systems and in jet fuel storage tanks. And so when you're looking at, if, if, if you have a plane that's got a microbial infestation um, and you're thinking, hey, how can I get rid of it? Well, you have to use a biocide. The problem is that there's only one biocide that's approved for use. And that is something that we're going to talk about in the next episode, a, a biocide chemistry called Biobore. Um, Let's say that you had a plane and you said, well, I, I'm going to kind of ignore that and I'm going to use this other uh, uh, nitromorphalin chemistry uh, in it. Well, the nitromorphalin chemistry is not approved for use in aviation fuel. And the reason it's not approved for use in aviation fuel is because they haven't proven that the nitromorphalin chemistry uh, doesn't... Um, D doesn't cause problems in its interaction with jet fuel uh, system parts. Um, doesn't, you know, it basically hasn't proven that it's safe for use in an airplane. And if you're going to prove something for use in, 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 in an airplane, which is carrying somebody through the sky, where if, if there's a problem that develops with the fuel, that plane's going to crash and somebody's going to die. Um, if, if, if you haven't proven that, then it's probably not a good idea to try put that into an airplane. And so that's an example. Aviation is an example of a use-specific approval that uh, really only one biocide has. So um, 
we're starting to run a little bit long, so we're going to kind of stop there. <clears throat> and we're going to continue this next time where we're going to talk a little bit more about this biocidal approval product, process. And uh, once we do that, then we're going to actually get into some of the specific biocides that are out there. And we're going to talk about what they do. We're going to talk about the differences between them. And we're going to talk about what's known about uh, which ones have the pros and cons of each, if you will. Because like I've said in other episodes, there are good and bad things about anything. Nothing is completely good. Nothing is completely bad. We have to acknowledge the good and bad of everything. And biocide, different biocide formulations are no exception. So that is going to wrap up this episode of the Fuel Pulse Show podcast. We hope that you uh, found this useful. Um, found this interesting and we want to thank you very much for joining us uh, today uh, for the Fuel Pulse Show podcast. Um, if you liked what you heard, uh, we would appreciate it if you, well, first of all, if you have not done so, if you'll subscribe to the Fuel Pulse Show podcast at where the, your favorite place for getting your podcast. Um, another thing is uh, if you would leave us a review, if you liked what you saw, leave us a review at iTunes or Stitcher or wherever you get your podcast because reviews are very important for helping get the word out and helping people find us. So until next time, I'm Eric Bjornstad, your host, thanking you for joining us for the Fuel Pulse Show podcast.